When you go to a program, you're looking for tactics. So everybody wants that magic move that give me the one liner for this and how do I get past the gatekeeper and all this stuff that may be important to you. That alone will not work. So I believe that there's a triangle and we call it the success triangle. There is attitude, behavior and technique. Welcome to the Modern Selling Podcast, where we help the entire sales community to create more sales conversations with today's modern buyer. This includes anyone from entrepreneurs and business owners to sales reps and sales leaders. Each episode, you will hear from sales leaders, practitioners, and influencers to help you find, engage, connect, and nurture your relationships with your buyers. I'm Mario Martinez Jr., your host, and you're now listening to the Modern Selling Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, the Modern Selling Podcast is back here with you, and you would not believe who I'm with today. It's taken me over a hundred and 30 episodes to get this person on the show. We finally got popular enough to get his presence on the show, and I'm super pumped. I want to welcome to the Modern Selling Podcast, Mr. Dave Matson, CEO and president of Sandler Training. Dave, welcome, man. Thanks, man. Listen, I've been looking forward to this, and uh, I'm not sure it's because of the size. I think it was just you finally invited me. I've been sending notes on the email. Hey, when can I get on? Hey, Dave, you know, when we've run out of everyone else, we're going to call you, buddy. So come on now. (laughs) Brutal, brutal. (laughs) I love it. Well, it finally was time, and I had to have knowledge. The stars are aligned. The stars aligned, man. So I'm excited to have you. So thank you so much. It's going to be an interesting conversation. We got some great questions that we developed in the pregame show, if you would, to talk through with sellers and sales leaders. But before we get into that, 32 years, yeah. 32 years with Sandler. Congratulations. That's amazing. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your whole history and how you basically, I'm going to say you grew up at Sandler and now obviously the CEO, president, and you're the owner. I was a client. So if I go way back to 1986, I was actually a client. And it's worse than that. I was a sentee. I was one of those people in the back of the room, like, I don't need training. I thought a couple things. You know, I grew up in a household where they're all educators. And I thought that you were born a salesperson. And when I went to work (laughs) selling memory typewriters at first, now think about that for a second. You know, we blew people's minds where you, if you hit this button, it actually does the form on its own. Right. <laughs> wow. You know, <laughs> that was big stuff back then. That, you know, I'm aging myself. And if you want to be employed, this is what we're doing. So I went to this class, which was Sandler, and I fell in love with it because I learned a couple things. I learned that I'm an introvert by nature. So if you take all those types of psychological tests, it'll come up to, hey, Dave's a Dave's not a natural gift of gab and all those things. But I also learned it was based on psychology, and I really gravitated towards that because it wasn't a script-based seminar. It wasn't a script-based approach, and I didn't have to be someone else. And I realized, okay, one, I could be who I wanted to be, and two, salespeople are not born, they're made which means it's my responsibility to become the best that I can be. Like no one's a born tennis player or a born CEO or a born president. You know, half of us just kind of fell into these roles if you're, if we're being honest with each other. Yeah, and sure. so that's kind of what happened. And so I went to work for a local trainer of Sandler. As I said to myself after I was in the seminar, the best way to become a sales machine is to work for the machine itself. And I did that. And I had the opportunity to see Dave Sandler. He would bring us down to Baltimore, which is where our home office is, you know, for reinforcement training, because that's what we believe in. And I got to see the guy. And of course, I was already listening to, I'm going to age myself again, listening to all the tapes and I could repeat this. And I was like a junkie at that point, right? I mean, I was like, I was in the cult. (laughs) <laughs> and when I when I heard Sandler say, hey, I'm looking for somebody to help me train the trainers because we're scaling at such a pace, psh, I'll do that. Now, I'm in my late 20s, right? So 
pack everything up. I'm coming down to Maryland. And I got to work with Dave Sandler for six years, which was incredible. You know, somewhere in that time period around 1994, early 94, David asked me to be his partner, which is a whole story in itself. We'll do that some other time. But the interesting thing was that I had money. But he wanted more money, of course, you know. Right. <laughs> and so every salesperson wants more. Exactly. You know, no matter what number I came up with, I honestly I think it was never just gonna be enough. You know, I should have asked him what the number was first. You know, so what happened was no bank would give me the money because I was too young. You know, I had a home and had assets, but nope, too young. I said, Well, oh my goodness, okay. So I said something to my parents about, hey, it's frustrating, you're judged on age, not on whatever you have and all that other stuff. And they went unknown to me, they actually went and mortgaged their home and gave me the money. Now, wow. how incredible is that? I mean, I have five kids and I'm pretty sure I'm not mortgaging my house for my <laughs> kids. You know, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so I actually became Sandler's partner and David passed away in 95. But I had those six years where I worked with him and every single day and had lunch every day. And it was just an awesome experience. And when he had passed, nothing happened for a while, even though you know, I was an owner, but 25%. And then in 2007, we bought out David's wife. And then I bought everything out in 2012. So I was in a family owned business, but I wasn't the family member. So when David passed, it became a little uncomfortable because, you know, your mentor passes and I was his protege and I wasn't a family member, but everyone else is a family member. So right. what are we going to do with that guy? And that was <laughs> me, you know, I, but I made everyone money. And so I think that's probably one of the reasons why they stuck me around here, which to me, it's always been a passion. Uh, I tell my parents now, hey, listen, I'm in the education business too. I just train adults, which are nothing more than kids and big people clothing, <laughs> much like you did. And uh, that's kind of where I got to. So I'm sure you pay back your parents' mortgage, of course. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, that took me two years, immediately got that thing back to them. No vacations, no nothing. That's exactly and then, right. And then I bought them a place in Florida as a thank you. So all is there, love reciprocity, right? That's right. That's right. And th th those are the types of things that keep you motivated when you know you've got somebody else's money that is uh, right. sitting on your head and shoulders, right? Yeah, of course. You know, it's a lot of pressure. But at the same time, that motivation made me just do probably this much in this very short amount of time, right? Because I need to get that done. And it became very creative because I knew what I was paid by Sandler. So I came to him with some ideas and said, hey, if I did this and brought in this type of revenue, could I have X? And I was making the presentation because sure, like it, it was never going to happen, but it did happen because I was super motivated to your point. And, you know, I've had that drive anyways, you know, because I didn't grow up with a lot of money. We had no money right. really. So, you know, I did the paper route thing and then the shoveling of the driveways, picking tobacco at 14, because that's the only thing you could do at 14 in Connecticut, believe it or not, picking tobacco. And, you know, <laughs> and then I went on to work. So that world of entitlement, I never was a part of. I didn't grow up that way. It's funny, I'm totally digress here for a second, but it reminds me of a lot of my personal story too. I was the first in my family to go to college and um, believe it or not, when I applied as a senior in uh, high school, I only had $41 in my checking account to apply for all of the colleges that I wanted to go to. And of course, back then to apply to a UC college in California, you had to pay $40 per application. So I only had enough for one, one. <laughs> college. Yeah. I had always dreamed of going to UC Berkeley. I don't know why. I don't know what got in my, in my brain, but it was UC Berkeley. So it was all or nothing. So I was either going to get in at UC Berkeley or I was going to go to massage therapy school. And somehow, some way, I got in. Yeah. And, uh, I remember getting inside there and I was, you know, just like, oh my God. And I remember my parents sitting me down at the table. I remember times that my parents didn't eat to make sure that we had enough yeah. for all the kids. Yeah. And I came from a family of seven. So my parents sat me down and they said, we really think that you shouldn't go. You should probably go to a junior college. We don't have any money to help contribute. So it's probably not a good idea. I remember, I, I remember this day where I was sitting at, I remember crying. I was so upset. I was angry that they would, you know, they, they were the ones pushing me all these to all this time. And all yeah. of a sudden now we're going to walk away from this, this dream. And I was like, no, 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 no. So what I decided to do was, is I was going to show them 
that I could do it. And what I did was, is I applied for over 200 scholarships. I went to the library and wow. you go to the, go to the books mm-hmm. and you look at every scholarship and I was mm-hmm. Mexican, Filipino, uh, Caucasian. Mm-hmm. So I was applying for all the scholarships. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Wherever yeah, yeah. I could, right. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it, it, whatever I could qualify for. And mm-hmm. I did, I ended up getting my first year paid for through scholarships and grants wow. and a little bit of loans. And well, then same thing. Point, I mean, like you, you just went at it, right? I mean, you weren't going to exactly. take no for an answer. Exactly. No, and I was motivated because at this point, my parents didn't realize this, but it was their commentary, which was negative in my mind, which was I had to prove to them that it could be done and, and I could make it. And yeah. so my first year, I worked at Ritz Camera Centers. I don't know if you remember them. I do. I think I they do. were headquartered in, 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 uh, in Maryland, if yep. I'm not mistaken. They were. So I worked for Ritz Camera Centers, and there was a guy by the name of Hunter. He was our regional manager. He had a, he had a big giant toupee, and it was like the, it was like this big, you know, funny looking hairpiece. Yeah. I was working as a photo finisher in Concord, and I I asked for a transfer to Berkeley, and he transferred me. But he told me, he came to the store. He says, "Like I can't approve your transfer," and I was like, "What? What do you mean you can't? I, I need this job." Right. And uh, he says, "No, you applied as a photo finisher." And I'm like, "Okay." And and he said. I'm going to approve it as you going into sales. And I said, sales? Why would I go to sales? Yeah. How'd I get demoted? What happened? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All I was doing, I was doing magenta, yellow, blue. Yeah. Like, Come on, man. Yeah. I've been <laughs> downgraded was, now. Exactly. Well, what I, what I didn't know was according to the sales performance records for the region, I was the number three salesperson in the region as a full-time photo finisher. As a non-salesperson. As a non-salesperson. Right. And so he said to me, you got something. I'm going to put you over there at Berkeley, which was our, one, our second largest store in the region. And then there was Oakland Rockridge. And eventually, they moved me over to Oakland Rockridge as a full salesperson to be able to drum up sales. So I ended, wow. up, being, I ended up being the first part-timer mm-hmm. that, no, that hit number one mm-hmm. as a, in sales as a part-time person. So uh, that was my story. And, and That's uh, amazing. Well, if you think about even in today's world, look what happened to you. You know, how many organizations have we gone in and trained and they want us to train the sales group, but yet here are the sales engineers or here are the people who actually talk to the customer and we don't train them. When in reality, if it were up to me and I could only train one group, I would train that group because sure, they're hungry. Sure. They already have the trust of the client. It's such an easy discussion, especially when you don't call it sales, right? Oh, oh yeah. Because if we said, hey, Mario, you're a salesperson. But we're, oh, I can't do that. I mean, you know, you'd have frozen potentially. But I think right. if you were to train that group of people in any organization, I think that the ROI is humongous. Now, so you were three, you know, third out of bunch of studs and studettes that were quote unquote trained killers right and here you are just a photo finisher just a photo finisher <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was it was great i mean it really it really that you know that type of motivation and i think you know we got totally got off target here on the conversation but honestly if you think about it everybody's got to have something that motivates them mm-hmm. and uh, something that i did at, when i sat in the seat as a leader of which we're actually starting up again here at vingresso that we'll be doing here at the beginning of this year every year everybody had to come in and present their Y boards. Mm-hmm. Now they could do it as a hard copy whiteboard. They can do it as a PowerPoint. And I used to do this with my team. And I remember one year a rep came in and said, I have a dream. I want to build a house in Brazil. Uh, she had been going there for many, many years and she'd learned wow. to speak Portuguese. And so I said, how much is going to cost? And she had identified how much it's going to cost, where it was going to mm-hmm. be at. We figured out it was going to cost a quarter million dollars. So I said, now we got to work backwards. What do we need to sell? Mm-hmm. And then once we figured out what we needed to sell, we said, which accounts we can go after. And sure enough, we had an account that we got kicked out of seven years prior to in our globals accounts. And it's one of the largest gasoline companies in the world. In two years, we ended up taking home a $60 million brand new contract. And, you know, <laughs> understanding that seed of motivation, I think is super critical as an individual, whether you're a business owner, whether you're a salesperson, whether you're a sales leader, you need to understand yours and your people's motivation as well. I agree. And I think, you know, what you just said, most sales leaders should listen to because people work for themselves a lot harder than they are the organization. And, and what you did is you took the organization's goals and tied them to her personal goals. And so, you know, when everyone else is doing something on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock, I'm sure she's still doing her thing because she has to hit those daily behaviors that are necessary to hit her number, which is necessary to get her house. And that's motivation. That's the why that I think some salespeople 
people never figure it out and you should. And the sales managers never make that connection, which is always, to me, it boggles my mind because you can unleash the animal in every single person if you just figure out. Like if I were to say to you, hey, you got a $10 million quota. And if you did it, you know, you get about 200 grand. Out of curiosity, what would you do if you hit your quota and you got 200 grand? Right. Oh, I would right. do this. I'd get college education for my kids. I'd do this wedding over here. And then create the pictures and put them right on their desks. And they look at it every day. They're not going after your quota. They could care less about your quota. They're going after the stuff that's important to them. And that's motivating because they're looking at, oh, I got to pay for a wedding. Oh, I got to pay for this. You know, you're not going to go home and say, honey, I have no money for the wedding because I decided mm-hmm. to kind of wimp out over here at work. <laughs> you know, that's not going to work. You know? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, and it's true. I, re- I remember using that uh, uh, very specifically. We were going through pricing approvals and we needed a new pricing point in, that in the marketplace was pricing and finance. We were working for big Fortune 100 and pricing and finance were just like, there's no way. So, you know, we had to maneuver our way through. And I remember one day she came in and she was so upset. We wouldn't get the pricing. And of course, I had to do an end around and go to our president. But long story short was I said, remember, remember what you're here for. Remember the house that you want. You want it? Don't right. give up. Let's keep right. going, right? And so that's your uh, hit the nail on the head and we, we'd absolutely use that as well. Yeah. That's a lesson of the day. There you go. Find that seed of motivation. That's just a great leadership tip. And we know it, we know it, but mm-hmm. prepare those why boards. And that's actually something we're doing uh, later on this year with Vingresso. All yes. right. We spent a lot of time in the great introduction, good learning lessons right there already, right from the man and the myth and the legend himself. I forgot to ask you something that nobody knows about you, even if they're looking at your social profiles. Give me something juicy, man. Well, I have a, a list of things that I'm afraid of, right? Oh. And so one of the things that I wanted to do is to attack those. And most of it's fantasy. You know, you, you over-exaggerate all these things. But so I've checked off two this year. And when one would have been skydiving and the other one it was bungee jumping. Oh, wow. uh, so I've got one more left, but that entails, you it? know, great whites. <laughs> so ah. we'll see if I, can, if I can get in the cage and actually, that, is, that actually freaks me out the most. It's probably because I haven't done it yet because the other ones freaked me out too. But I'm like, I don't know. We'll see. I actually did spend a couple of weeks out in South Africa and okay. Cape Town and Joburg, Medikwe. It was like, it was an amazing trip. It was an absolutely amazing trip, but I was very tempted, but you know what freaked me out? Uh, hopefully this doesn't freak you out. It wasn't so much getting in the cage with the sharks, right? You know, where you go down and they, you know, mm-hmm. put the food out there and they're all, you know, going with a frenzy. Right. Right. The thing that scared me were the wires that were holding the cage because if those broke, I'm tumbling down yeah. to the bottom of the yeah. ocean. <laughs> yeah. And I'm pretty sure the laws over there aren't the same as the safety laws over here, right? I reckon. Is there, is there a safety? Uh, no, we don't need an extra cable. That one right there will be fine. Really? We're just okay. fine. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> We've tested it. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So where, where do you plan on going? Are you going like, you know, Cape Town? Is that, is that what you're going to plan in South Africa or where? Yeah, no, it's going to be South yeah. Africa. And I'm going to, you know, I've got five kids. So I thought we would all Family head over. Affair? Yeah, I'm trying to take money out of the money bank and put it into the memory bank. And so you go. that's what we're trying to do. I love it. Great. Well, you let me know when that happens. And uh, I will. well, you've you certainly motivated me now. I mean, you've, you couldn't have oversold it any better than that. So you did, you did fine. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Well, listen, I want to get into something that I think is a really good topic and something that we talk about all the time with sales leaders. Millions of people are, you know, seek training every single year. Yeah. And Sandler, if I'm not mistaken, you guys are training about 31,000 people every single year. Is that right? That's right. It's a lot of people. But, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. But one of the problems that we see, and I'm sure you see it as well, is as soon as you go through a training, days later, the next day, people are going right back into their old ways. Yeah. What the heck? Why? Well, it happens for a couple of different reasons. And, and it can be prevented. That's the good news, right? So I think the first thing that happens is that we don't even acknowledge that we're, we're going to lose more than half of what we just learned. So, right. you know, we're in the moment, we don't take good notes and the notes that you take, you can't even read in a week anyways. Right. right. So I, I try to let people take hot lists. It's just one or two things you're going to take out of that. But I think that's one. The other one is that we don't take what we learned in the classroom when it's real fresh, especially if we've gone with coworkers and say, what could we apply to us? I mean, what are we going to actually drill down on? We just got six hours of content. It was awesome. What are we going to do first? And if you would just take one of those 30 topics and implement it and and get some momentum and get confidence and conviction, then you can try another one. When I first learned Sandler, I didn't use it all. I actually became 
an absolute disciple. When I used it, when I had no no other opportunity, it was that call was so dead that I used one of those Sandler close to file moves, and next thing you know, it was there. I was like, okay, now I'm going to try it again. But I think it's unrealistic to think they're going to get everything. Now, my other couple are, I don't think people practice their talk tracks. And so regardless if it's a seminar or if you're learning things on your own or you've got a a company playbook, how many of us that are listening really do know your talk tracks? I mean, you can just, okay, give me your 30 second commercial. Okay, give me this. Uh, A lot of us can't, right? Because we don't necessarily over prepare. We're going to go in and make that call based on experience, which is called wing it, right? Right, right? So that doesn't there. But, but I think the big one is this. When you go to a program, it doesn't matter who's doing it, you're looking for tactics. So everybody wants that magic move that give me the one liner for this and how do I get past the gatekeeper and all this stuff that may be important to you. That alone will not work. So I believe that there's a triangle and we call it the success triangle. I think that there is attitude, behavior, and technique. Everybody at seminars gravitates towards technique. Technique is short-lived because you can have great technique, but if you also haven't thought about what do I have to do every single day to be successful, you could have great technique but not do it enough. That's not going to help you. Or mindset. I mean, I think 80% of success resides between your ears, right? We can talk ourselves in and out of a great golf game and a great sales call. So if you don't think about, hey, I could use that and I have equal business stature and kind of change the way that you think it's not going to be as successful. So if you deal with all three, and I'll just use prospecting as an example, we teach prospecting, we have great tactics, but really what we do is we say, and here's what you should be doing every single day to make this easy. And here's how you should think about it. Look at it from this perspective, not this perspective. It's almost like I have a dog. And so my dog hates medicine. I mean, it just, so I I wrap it in cheese or I have to put it in, you know, a piece of meat or whatever the case may be. And then they love it. Same thing with sales. If you know what's going to show up and say, hey, you know, today is attitude training. And they're like, oh, attitude training, feel good (laughs) training. You got to be kidding me. But if you say, I'm going to give you five ways that you can get past voicemail jail on this, you got everybody's attention. But you have to do all three, in my opinion, to make it stick. And here's the magic. The one that never happens enough is sales leadership's follow up. Yeah. You know, as a sales leader, it's your responsibility to keep that going. They're not going to learn something at the seminar and you think they're just going to, you know, automatically just implement everything. I always say to the C suite when I'm out there selling Sandler, the biggest thing that's going to make or break this program isn't Sandler. It isn't the people in the classroom. It's the sales leadership. We need them to reinforce it. We need them to role play. We need them to actually use the words because think about when there's no congruency. If you go to a seminar and they say, do this and everyone makes sense. And then you go back and it's the end of the month and they say, yeah, I know what they said. Here's what I want you to do because we got to hit these numbers. Pretty soon that becomes non-important, right? So you have to kind of decide once you've come up with this is our way of doing it. This is our sales process, whatever it is for you that you're all in. And the only way to make it part of your DNA is to do those things that we talked about. So one more time, the success triangle has attitude, behavior, and technique. I love that. Uh, you know, it was interesting. You mentioned, uh, you know, you're sitting inside of a training and generally I think the rule of thumb is, is you sit there for two days, you retain about 30% or less. Right. Yeah. And what we found here at Vangresso is we actually converted our entire workshop training programs into a complete VILT program. And we are doing that over one quarter. So a three month, and then there's yeah. the rest of it is through reinforced training. Now what happens is, is we're spending an hour to an hour and a half per week as a rep and learning a very specific technique and we're going over that specific focus area. And then that's that's the textbook. And then the next week we do live hands-on practical followed on by reinforced coaching if you need it, kind of like the office hours mm-hmm. with the professor. Mm-hmm. And what we've seen is the adoption rate starts to go much, much higher when you slow down that pace among right. amidst many, many different things that a seller is challenged by. And that virtualizing it and allowing people to learn from their own home and then actually practice and play. And when you're doing social, it, it is a lot of practice and play, right? Because you get to do it almost immediately, right? Yeah, uh, right. And same thing with video. When you're teaching a seller how to leverage video, which is what we do, it's almost instantly. I can turn around. I learn the technique. I learn the skill. I take the script. I take the you know the call to talk track, and I go create a video, and then I send it. So we've learned some really interesting things about moving from a workshop based over course of time, 
And a lot of leaders come to us and they're always looking for that quick fix, Dave. Yeah. Right. I know. We get yeah. the phone call all the time. Hey, can you come in and we're going to do a sales kickoff, you know, spend just a, do a half day and teach us everything. Yeah, exactly. You, you can do it. Yeah. Get him pumped up, get him to use it. And then we're, Oh, by the way, you don't have four hours. We're going to take an hour for product training. Now, could you get it done in 60 minutes? Like what? Exactly. Exactly. You're kidding me. <laughs> what, 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 so, so whenever we hear that, it's like, Kurt Shaver, our chief sales officer, just mm-hmm. put a post out and he said, we had a sales leader to call us and say, hey, we want to do one hour worth of social selling training. We want our reps to be able to learn how to use social. And it's like, wait, wait, can you learn anything in an hour? I can motivate them. I can get yeah. them pumped up about yeah. the idea and the mindset, but you can't change behavior in one hour. No. And that I mean, goes that's... right back to the, to the point that you mentioned about sales, leadership, follow-up. That could not be more important, that engagement and follow-up. Well, I, I like the way that you guys, you do theory, and then you come back and do application. And what I love about that is that under pressure, people revert back to what they're accustomed to doing. So they exactly. could hear you. doesn't really mean anything. Your ears have to hear what your mouth says. And once you've practiced, and by the way, the first time you say anything, it's horrific. I mean, I fire myself every time I practice. I'm like, oh my goodness gracious, that was terrible. <laughs> but you do it four, five, six times. And next thing you know, you're a machine. And then you feel comfortable actually doing it in real life. And yeah. that's the magic. And that coaching and, and all the stuff that you'd said is, is spot on for sure. Yeah, it's funny because we get a lot of leaders as well and just about the program. And then I'm talking about this not because I'm, I'm putting a plug, is because I want leaders to think differently about mm-hmm. how we change behaviors. And you guys are leading the charge, right? I mean, we're just copying what the, what the big players are doing out there like you guys, <laughs> which, is the, which is you set the pace for us. But what we get leaders all the time is like, we want to go faster. We want instant results. We want them to do – it's like, but wait. Yes, I understand we want instant results because, by the way, I sat in the seat for 18 years and I know sure. that we need the results, right? I get mm-hmm. it. But do I want to have something that they do today and not do tomorrow? Or do I want them to do something today and tomorrow and the next day? And that's yeah. where, you know, I think a lot of sales leaders, which bothers me about uh, sales leaders, whenever my sales teams, when I sat in the seat, whenever my sales teams were going through a training, I was there with them Absolutely. all the time, the whole time, never left the room yeah. because I wasn't allowed to, they weren't allowed to leave the room. I shouldn't be allowed to leave the room. And that was at the vice president level. Yeah, absolutely. Good for you. I believe that that role is one of the most important roles in an organization. So let me say that. But I also think it's the least trained group of people in any organization, right? You are awesome in sales. Just replicate yourself. If you could do 50 U's, this company would be great. So when you, they come to us and say, hey, can I do social selling in an hour or four hours? And, and you know, as the, as the expert, you shake your head. They're trying to check a box, right? Hey, we brought in an outside company and all that. But think about sales as a profession for a second, right? And we should be looking at it that way. Would you say if uh, you went to a doctor, hey, did you go to learn how to do this? Oh, absolutely. I went to a four-hour seminar. It was awesome. What? Really? For the open heart? Oh, yeah, that's it. check the box. That was great. My sales leader said, hey, no problem. Okay. And actually, next week, I'm going to learn for a half a day. I'm going to learn how to do knees. Oh, my goodness. You know, or even <laughs> pilots. So we know in other professions, it's so ridiculous. But yet right. we accept it in our own. And I have no idea why that continues. It just boggles my mind. That's a great illustration. Have you seen that commercial uh, where the nurse is talking yeah, to yeah. the guy on the bed? <laughs> yeah. And she's like, he's like, how's the doctor? Oh, he's okay. He's okay. Doctor yeah. comes in. <laughs> he's like, hey, well, I, just, I just got back from uh, being out, out of, uh, you know, whatever. I forget what he says. And they're like, what? I'm almost reinstated. <laughs> almost. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. I love that, that, that reminds me of that. I love that commercial. But it reminds me exactly what you just said. Yeah. Like, why? Why do we think that we can change right. the world in one hour? <laughs> no, it's ridiculous. One of the big challenges that we have as well in many companies as we look at to scale and grow sales teams is making new hires successful. Mm-hmm. And I have been there as a leader where mm-hmm. we brought on somebody and we're talking about nine month to 12 month long ramp ups. Yeah. And there's a lot of reasons why that happens. And many times it's because of internal and process and enablement and this, but the, but, but the key is, is driving that down. How do we more quickly make new hires successful inside of an organization? Okay, so let's set the stage. Let's assume for a minute you have a great hiring process. But I also think that sometimes the greatest sales call a salesperson's ever made is on you during the interview. 
right? Because you've got like Tom Cruise sitting in front of you during the interview. You put him on yeah. payroll and here comes Rodney Dangerfield. I mean, like what happened? Well, who <laughs> is this person? But let's assume we're past all that and it's a good hire. I mean, look, the new hire, they want to succeed. They want to do well and you want them to do well. So what does an onboarding program normally look like? Well, some people just throw this big book on the table. That's our operations manual. Everything that you need is there. Others, they take the new hire and they put him with a veteran, right? Somebody who knows the ropes. And I want you to spend a week with Mary. And then after that, I'll spend some time with you and you, everything will be fine. So what you're doing is you're actually, Mary has no organized method to teach you. And so you're watching Mary. And if you're in outside sales, you know what Mary actually taught you? All the best places to eat over in this town, because that, that's what we do. We don't really know. So I think there's a systematic way to do this. I can cut the onboarding process down by a third, easy. Hmm. But the first thing that you have to do is to track the time from hire to the time of profitability. Now, you said, hey, it's going to take me that amount of time to ramp up. But I also think, you know, you've talked to enough sales leaders over the years. I bet you nine out of 10 people can't tell you that. How long does it take for them to be profitable? They have no idea, you know, and they blame it on the person. Well, if they would study more, hey, if they would do this, it would be higher, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I think there's a method that you could use to onboard an idea or onboard an employee. And there's four steps, and I'm, I'm happy to share them with you if you want yeah, me to. Please, I, please do. Yeah, so Absolutely. here's what they are. Step number one, and I'm going to simplify uh, a consulting model that we do to four quick steps. One is make a list, and I'm going to talk for salespeople now, right? And by the way, salespeople, we can do this on our own. So if your managers aren't doing this, do it on your own. I mean, you do work for yourself anyways, right? I mean, right. ultimately, you've incorporated yourself. So make a list of everything that you would want to be great at. Like in order for you to be the best in your company, what would you have to know? And so there's about 60, 65 things on there. So let's just pick some examples because I'm going to use them in a second or two. Let's say um, 30 second commercial or elevator pitch. I could do value prop, company history. I could do competitive landscape, running a, you know, my first call, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got all this stuff listed out. And that's something you could either do as a team or certainly the sales leader could do the heavy lifting. Sure. Here's step number two. So step number two is put it in order of priority. Now I use a calendar, so I put out a one-year calendar and I say at the end of week one, you don't have to know all 65 of these things. It's, you know, you don't have to do a QBR. You have no one to talk to. So we can put that off to the side. I want you, how do you get appointments and how do you make a first call? So I put them in order of priority and I break it down for you. And I also make it broken down into smaller pieces, right? So I'm going to say, hey, look, you really should know those four things at the end of week one. Let's just stop there for a second. Now, what does that do? Well, I've told this new hire that if you learn this first, you're going to have a higher probability of success, which is the first aha moment for most of them because they don't know where to start, right? Mm. But I'm also creating an atmosphere or a culture of accountability because as we move forward, here's what happens. So here's my list. Here's the order that I'm supposed to learn it and know it and be able to do it. The third thing is, you have to give them an example of what it is. You can't just say, you should know your first phone call. You should have a good 30 second commercial. Okay, I get it. I get that. But left upon myself, I'm going to do the best I can, but everyone in the company is going to have a different one. So as a leader, you should be able to say, you know, hey, look, 30 second commercials, week one, here's an example. And you just hand it to them. And now I could say, okay, now I'm going to learn my script, whatever I do. Now at Sandler, I give you a playbook, which is here it is, but I also have an audio version so you can listen to it. So now I've given you every one of those 65 things in written form, which takes time, by the way, it's not easy. And then I give it to them in an audio format and they can listen to it a million times because adults, we right. learn by imitation and illustration, right? We mimic. So why not just put down what you want them to say and you have found is the best of the best. It's not always me on video or audio. I've got whoever's the best in that particular category is doing it, which by the way, they love. It's a good stroke for them too, right? Absolutely. And so now here's what I have. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know what I'm supposed to be doing it by, and I have an example of what we consider to be awesome. Step four is, I want you to test it. So what does that mean, sales leaders? Because this is your job now. So let's go back to the example. On Friday, I have to do a 30-second commercial. 
I've had an example. I've listened to it. I've made it mine. Because what is this person doing all week? Well, they're practicing. They're saying, hey, on Friday, I'm going to talk to my manager. I want to be the best I can. So I'm practicing my 30-second commercial all week long. And so I'll go back to that other statement of establishing a culture of accountability because you've now set the expectations. You've given me an example, and now it's up to me to step up. And that's always one of those big things that leaders say, hey, I need accountability in my department. You've just started. But here's the test. So now I'm going to call you on a Friday. And so I call up and I say, hey, Fred, it's Dave. Hey, listen, I know today I think we're going to do 30-second commercial. We're also doing your prospecting phone call. Where would you like to begin? 30-second commercial. Great. Let's hear it. And now they do it. Now, Mm -hmm. chances are that's about the hundredth time that's come out of their mouth. So now they're feeling confident. Now they have conviction. I know they're going to say the exact same thing in front of a live person because they've done it enough times. Once they do it, now I have the opportunity to coach and I have the opportunity to train. Hey, we should tweak this. Hey, let me show you how I would do it. And all those wonderful things happen. But here's the magical thing. Sometimes people make it through our hiring process that maybe shouldn't have, or I don't really know who's going to be my rising star or not. What I have found over 30 years is that when you do that process, your top producers are way ahead. They're saying, hey, I've got the cold call down. I've got the 30-second commercial. Would you like to go to week two and three? Because I've got that down. You've let them run as fast as they want to run and because you've given them the highway that says, this is the important things. This is what you have to know. So I love those people. They've actually self-identified themselves as they're going to do whatever it takes to succeed. And, they, and I love that. Here's the other type of person that maybe I shouldn't have hired. They dodge. They're hiding. So I call Friday. We've had an appointment. And hi, it's Dave. Unfortunately, I'm not able to answer the call today because I'm prospecting for a net new business. And, uh, you know, whatever they say to me, right? Or they call, right. say, oh, oh, I've got a cold, whatever. And I say to myself, once that happens a couple of times, or it's so horrific week after week when all they had to do is mimic what we gave them, it's easier for me to say, this is not a good fit. Not you either good. don't want to do what's necessary to succeed at this company, right? You're either unwilling or you're unable. And so yeah. if you're unwilling, you need to go. If you're unable, I'll coach and train. But if you continually be unable, then we've got issues. And I think sales managers, they could use that as a way to accelerate the onboard, accelerate the time it takes to profitability. And I think that's magic. I did this on my own, you know, and of course I do it now with all of my people, but I think everyone that's listening could do it regardless of what role they play. And you don't have to do everything, all 65 in the beginning. You may have 50, but, you know, this takes time to, you know, it's a journey. But I bet you after about a year, you'd have most of them done. And uh, you'd be amazed at how awesome that is. Because think about it, if you give a new hire that, that's great. And I give that to new product launches. If you have a new product or service, why not give them? This is what you should be saying. This is the script. You know, I love features and benefits. That's awesome. But that doesn't teach the salesperson how to position it or hear the qualifying questions or hear the symptoms that you're going to hear from the buyer. And this is what you should listen for. And I think that's all the magical stuff that you could capture and onboarding new ideas, onboarding new products and services or a new person. And I think that's what we do. And it works. So to repeat what you said, make a list of activities, prioritize a list of activities that you want the the rep to do, things that they should know. Give an example of what it is. So for example, if you want them to do a 30-second pitch, they can actually give them an example of a 30-second pitch. Yep. And then test it by having them practice themselves. And then they're going to practice in front of other people, which is going to create a culture of accountability. Yeah. Four steps. Yeah. Yeah. Super easy. But if you think about it, how many times, Dave, have you been in the mirror, in the bathroom, rehearsing or in the car driving, rehearsing what it is you're going to say to whatever it is that you're going to be saying it to. We do it all the time. I was going to say, I was going to say, you know, I have a 40 minute drive and the big thing here is they know I'm a big talk track guy. And when I'm doing a a keynote, it's harder to do a keynote than it is an eight hour program. Right. And so I will do a talk track every single morning as I come in, because it's too early to call anybody. And then on the way home, I always call customers. But I do a talk track every single day. And I do about 10 hours of rehearsal for a one hour presentation. It's just what we do to your point. And and that's why you're as good as, as you are and what you do. I mean, that's the reason why you weren't born this way. And 
you have the responsibility. If you believe that you are made, not born in the role that you're in, then you have the responsibility and the ability to be the best that you can be. Very good advice. And I hope sales leaders and reps, you may not even need your sales leader to do this. Make, take those four right. things that Dave just mentioned and do it yourself. DIY, DIY. Right. Yeah. It always uh, surprised me in organizations where we had people who did not succeed. And I'll be honest with you, they were right. We had a horrible sales enablement onboarding programs, right? It, was, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it just, it was horrible. I agree. But it always amazed me that I individually could say, I didn't sign up to fail. So I'm going to go do this. And you would figure out these things are, are things that we naturally would do anyways. And we should, we shouldn't rely on somebody else. So hopefully salespeople, you're listening in, go do it yourself. And sales leaders, make this a list. And to that end, Dave, I will tell you that one of the things I realized in our sales process mm -hmm. was that we didn't have a set of recordings of what a prospecting call to mm -hmm. a closure of a contract looked like. Mm -hmm. So I went through and I took a campaign personally myself. Okay. And this was at the end of last year. And I recorded the whole entire campaign. And now we're using that for onboarding for new folks. There you go. To showcase, what do you say in call one? Mm -hmm. What are you looking for? Mm -hmm. And then how do you use that information in call two, three, four? Right. And then how do you eventually get to, all right, here's what it looks like. And then when they say, oh my God, it's going to cost $1 million. What well, do you say? Right. What do you say? Well, actually, you told me that the problem was a $50 million problem. <laughs> right, right. So let's put this in perspective, right? Yeah. So you have that ability. So we actually recently just did that to your point. And I, I thought it was a critical milestone that we had to have is I want my guys to go out and prospect. They have to model them. something. They have yeah. to model something or they're going to make it up. Exactly. You know? Hey, our kids spend half their life watching what we do. And that's why they spend the last half of their life doing exactly what they said they weren't going to do, right? Like, oh my gosh, I became my parent. But <laughs> think about it is also as a sales leader, because sales leaders always tell me, hey, that sounds great. I have no time, Dave. And so what you just said, that's great. That takes time. I have no time. But two things come to my mind. One, I think we always measure time it takes to do something, not the time it takes to clean up our messes, right? And, yeah. But the other thing is all the pressure and responsibility put on you as a sales leader to onboard me and to train me disappears because now the pressure is on the person. You have given them the tools. It's now on them. And if you think about all the things that you have to do in today's world, time compression, you have saved yourself so much time by transferring all that pressure and work right to the person it belongs to the salesperson. Yeah. Valid point. One thing to, to that end is sales leaders. Well, you know, I'm not out on the front lines. I don't do that. Are you kidding me? Get out there and do it then. Model the behavior you want them to demonstrate. In my keynotes, I talk about this. Your title says VP of, usually the, the word is sales. Director of, usually the word is sales, right? CSO, that little S is an sales. So get out there and do it. Be out there on the front lines. We implemented in Bingresso and I, I've always, always, I me mean personally, I've always said if I can eliminate any type of administrative work to a salesperson, I'm going to take it off their plate, right? Even in my in corporate. And so here at Bingresso, I was like, no, no, you're not doing contract implementation. No, you're not sitting on an implementation call with a customer. No, you're not going to be talking to finance and looking at billing. No, you're not going to, like all these things we had to take off, but I had to know that this was the pain that they were going through because I experienced yeah. it by going through it myself so we can remove right. that off. 100%. And I just think that's, that's critical that sales leaders understand that they get into the trenches. I would remove some of that pressure. I think they should know it, but that doesn't mean they have to be the best in the company. Yeah, so I think, you know, if you have somebody that does, you know, a great value prop speech, let them do it. I mean, not that you as a sales leader, 100% agree. You should know it. I mean, come on now, right? You can't manage others of things you don't know. So I'm 100% in agreement. But I think as you do those examples of things that we talked about for the onboarding, I think it's kind of cool to have people throughout the organization contributing to that. And then it becomes our onboarding program and everyone wants to make it better. Uh, it's kind of cool. And it takes the pressure off that manager, as you say, which I agree with. Well, to that end, that is one of the reasons why we use conversational intelligence tools to record our conversations. Our CMO listens to all the sales conversations, every one of them. Mm -hmm. And that is how we developed our pitch decks, 
That is how we developed some of our new content pieces because he was hearing, oh, shoot, we don't have a, we didn't have, we needed, or that's a great call. You should use that for. And so we can do that as sales leaders to your point. Okay, maybe I'm not running the sales campaign, but I can listen into some of these conversational intelligence tools and hear who are my aces? What are they saying? Now take that call and mirror that behavior to the new. Yeah, you're creating a virtual playbook. Exactly. And as a sales rep, I can listen to your call too. I mean, I'm like, hey, you know, I think most of the times in those conversational intelligence tools, if you allow them, the sales reps will actually listen more than the sales managers listen sometimes. But, you know, to your point, those tools are awesome because most debriefs that we do as a sales leader is pure fantasy. They're telling you what they thought happened on the call and you're giving feedback and it's never reality. Yeah, so I right, love those right. tools. Love those tools. Now, you guys are doing uh, something new and interesting with respects to technology, I think, in this particular space, right? Yeah, we are. We're doing a, uh, quite a few things. So the technology for us has kind of changed over time. We're trying to make sure that we've got engagement and you've got adoption, you've got application. So when it comes to two different things that we're doing, one is we've moved all of our learning assets. So we've got like 7,000 pieces of Sandler content moved from our LMS, our platform, over to voice. And so you don't have to log into anything now. All you can say is, Alexa, I'd like to hear something I'm prospecting. And it gives you an option. And then next thing you know, it's coming up on your car. And so you can actually load up anything that you want to have your salespeople listen to. And I think the Achilles heel to most platforms is you have to log in. So that's right. there. And then, you know, of course, we've got some, we got some, uh, a partnership with a, a conversational intelligence AI tool, which to your point, I mean, I know those things very well there. I love those things. And I, I'm not sure who you use. Here, we we but, use Gong. We use Gong. Okay. So we're partnered with Gong, huge yeah. Gong fan, right? And I can tell you example, example on that, but I will tell you with the Gong, you think you know what's going on. You have no idea what's going on. And <laughs> exactly. if your sales funnel is clogged up, you know, you can listen to some calls and very quickly figure out that's not closing this month, even though Rep A said it's closing. And you say yeah. as a sales manager, did you talk about money? Absolutely, boss. Nailed it. Don't you worry. You listen to it. Hey, don't worry. You can afford Nothing. this. That's, that's your money step. Don't worry. You can afford it. You know, right. But you have the ability to create these virtual playbooks. So that is so important. You know what's happening now with technology, whether it's voice or conversational intelligence, technology is really turning this into a science. You know, and if you think about where marketing was 10 or 15 years ago, it was just like this fuzzy thing. We're marketing. Well, how do I measure it? I don't know. But, you know, I saw the ad. Today, that's not how it works. They've got dashboards upon dashboards upon dashboards. And that's really what's happening in the world of sales. So as far as Gong is concerned, huge fan. And we're doing more gamification. There's a thousand things going on in technology that we weren't doing five years ago. So you'll be proud of us, I think, Dave. What we decided to do was is take some of our gong calls and, you know, our implement, uh, as an example, it takes us two months for implementation with a customer. We're going through their scripts, their playbooks, all these things that we're preparing for them. And we're looking at onboarding a customer success organization uh, or additional individuals. So I said, well, why don't we just take the calls from this company and the calls from this company, we export them, put them into the whole entire video, put them into actually the learning platform. And guess what? We now have a course exactly. <laughs> of how to run a call yeah, that's <laughs> from proven. start to finish. Yeah, exactly. That's proven, right? You have the ultimate playbook now. A virtual playbook and all leveraged by Gong. They're great partners of ours. We love them to death. And, uh, you know, the key though is, the key is you can have all this recording and great technology that is, you know, pulling in snippets, but is, as a sales leader, are you listening to it? Right. And are you then coaching on that? Right. Same with CRM, right? I mean, everyone's got it, but who's really using it effectively? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, listen, I just checked the clock and man, we're, we're way over our time. I've had such a fabulous conversation and I know hopefully all of you listening are enjoying this conversation with Dave Madsen. Dave, you've got a number of different books, The Sand the Rules that you came out with, 49 Timeless mm -hmm. uh, Selling Principles and How to Apply Them. That was your first book, Success Cadence. You know, all of those books, guys, we're going to put them into the show notes. And, uh, you know, I encourage you to get out there and read. And uh, I'm an avid follower of uh, The Sandler Way, if you would, and watching the material and information. But Dave, if somebody wants to connect with you, what's the best way? Or, you know, should they tweet at you? Should they connect yeah, with you on LinkedIn? Uh, they, yeah, sure. Go to LinkedIn. Um, that's the easiest way. You can 
can certainly go to sandler.com. We've got 27 books, as you mentioned. You can get those either on Amazon or sandler.com, but reach out. I reply to everything, I promise. And he will, because I actually get personal communications from Dave. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll make sure we put it to the show notes, his LinkedIn profile, but just please, 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 everyone, if you're going to reach out to Dave on LinkedIn or Twitter, just make sure you told him where you heard him at was on the Modern right. Selling Podcast. So make sure you remind him, tell him you love this show. And Dave, before I'll tell we you get- what, I'll make you, uh, can I offer your listeners something that we know they'll actually have to say it came from the Modern Selling Podcast. If you say, if you say, hey, listen, I heard you on the Modern Selling Podcast, then I'll send you a crash the class thing, which means you can crash any one of our classes anywhere. You can pick the topic and go have at it and learn as much as you can and do all the things we talked about up front, practice and all those good things. But it'll be our, how about you and I, it'll be our gift. I love that. So uh, hopefully everybody heard that. And that's a crash the class pass. Is that what it's going to be? Yep. Yep. Oh, uh, that's a money ticket right there, man. Do I get one? Are they like, you do. Can I you get can one? You can have one too. You can have one too. <laughs> you have to send me a LinkedIn now and say, hey, I think I heard you on the Modern Selling Podcast. But I'll uh, We're going to have to put that one. So, so for everybody listening in, we're going to be tweeting about that and see people actually read the tweets and read the messages on that one. That's a great gift. So make sure you tell them. You heard them on the Modern Selling Podcast. Please send me a... Crash the class coupon and I will send it off to you. Fantastic. So there's your gift there. And tell all your friends to come listen to the Modern Selling Podcast, especially this one right here. There you have it, Mr. Dave Matson. 31,000 people a year. Dave, one last question. One last sure. question. Sure. Your all-time favorite movie, what is it? The Godfather. <laughs> the Godfather. Why I've is watched that? it a million times and there are so many business lessons in that. It's unbelievable. All right, there you have it. We've had The Godfather a time or two, so you've got Dave's favorite movie. And for all of you listening in right now, thank you so much. Listen into this very important message right here. Thanks for listening to the Modern Selling Podcast. Please do me a huge favor and give the Modern Selling Podcast a rating and review on iTunes. I would appreciate it. Also, if you want to easily find our show, just go to themodernsellingpodcast.com. Hey, since you'll be on our site, be sure to check out our Modern Marketing Engine podcast hosted by my co-founder and CMO, Bernie Borges. Thanks for listening in. And until the next episode, good selling.